Hello and welcome back to another episode of Random Finds in Paleo Media. This episode has been so long overdue, but to be fair, I've had a lot of other projects that have been keeping me busy lately. However, I felt that this series needed to make a return since it's been so long. But between the last episode and now, there's been a massive influx of new viewers on the channel, and chances are some of you probably aren't familiar with this series. Random Finds in Paleo Media is a series dedicated to compiling and covering all of the smaller bits of dinosaur related or dinosaur adjacent media that doesn't have enough depth or information to be its own video. What I will typically do is select three different smaller scale topics I randomly find around the internet and cover them in a single episode. This is episode 3, so if you haven't seen the first two episodes, I definitely recommend them and will link them down in the description below. However, you don't necessarily need to watch them in order to understand what's going on as there are different topics for every episode. But it would be nice if you just wanted to go check those episodes out cause you know, why not? And before we get started, I also want to mention that if you guys have any suggestions for topics that fit the criteria of this series, don't hesitate to suggest them down in the comments below. With all of that said, let's get to the three topics I have selected for today's episode. So a little while back, I went down a short but interesting path in trying to find a pretty obscure documentary that talks about life in the early days of the dinosaurs, more specifically in the Triassic period. Now you all should know by now that I'm a huge fan of lost, obscure, and rare media, so whenever there's media like that that's revolved around dinosaurs, or I guess in this case prehistoric reptiles that aren't dinosaurs, I can't help but to go on a deep dive in trying to find out as much as I can about it. And I was under the impression that this was lost media at first, but after doing some digging I did manage to find it and I think that some of you may actually be familiar with it depending on your region. This documentary is called In the Footsteps of the First Saurians. My search started on this site that contains most, if not all, paleo-related media that's ever been released, or at least known to the public at some point. And it is a pretty long list, so the next time you say we don't have enough dinosaur media out there, maybe take a look at this list first. I'm sure you'll find something here you like. And when I mean all paleo-related media, I mean this list consists of movies, TV shows, documentaries, and short films all revolving around dinosaurs and or other prehistoric creatures. But along with these massive lists of dinosaur TV shows and movies, there's also a much smaller category of media in which the date is unknown for them or they're considered lost. When I saw this list I immediately became intrigued and decided to look at each one of them to see if I could find any more information about them. But the one that I was interested in was in the footsteps of the first Saurians. I mean can you blame me with a name like that I'm definitely hooked. And considering how all of these things that are on this list have pretty generic titles for a dinosaur film or documentary, obviously this one was going to stand out. But looking into it I couldn't really find much on it, at first. The most I found were three different wiki pages on three different creatures that were said to have appeared in this documentary. These creatures were Tessinosuchus, Macrognemus, and Arizonasaurus, who each had a section on these pages that talked about their role in this mystery documentary. On this page, it said that this animal was featured in a French documentary that went by this name. And this was it, this French title was obviously the documentary we were looking for. And sure enough, looking up the name led me straight to the documentary itself, which which seems to have found a home on Daily Motion, a French video sharing platform which functions kind of like YouTube. The documentary runs a total of 60 minutes and is split into three parts and is part of a channel dedicated to archiving all sorts of documentaries. However, the channel hasn't been active in years it seems. But just from the three videos, there's a lot that can be said about the documentary. First off, the description of the video actually states what the documentary is about, which is great because as you'd guess, the whole thing is in French, a language that I'm not fluent in. So even after watching the documentary, I'm still left very confused. But I did put this description through Google Translate to help me out a little bit, but it is possible there might be some mistakes. So for anyone that's fluent in French that's watching this video, correct me if there's anything wrong with this translation. This is the only real synopsis I could find about the show and it appears in the description of this first part and it reads, In 2008 in Bernburg, in the land of Saxony-Anhalt, the German paleontologist Cages Dietrich unearthed saurian footprints more than 240 million years old. Paleoignology, study of footprints, 3D models, 
models as well as scientific methods of actualism, which consist in extrapolating the appearance of the Saurians from the behaviors of animals today, have provided the first ways to revive their world. But to better decipher these footprints, we also need to know more about the climate and the nature of the soils in the region of Germany 240 million years ago. So this documentary is quite literal in its title in the sense that it's literally about footprints of some of the first reptiles to ever walk the earth. Kind of. Given what these creatures are, we can say that it takes place in the mid-Triassic period and we know that reptiles have been around a lot longer than that. Several hundred million years in fact. Regardless, it's interesting to see people going in depth into this area of paleontology, seeing how it's one that isn't really covered all that much. Especially in this form. As far as its background goes, there's not a whole lot of information on it. Based on what's shown in the video itself, there is a logo in the corner marked as Art HD, which is a European public access TV channel that mainly airs cultural programming. And that's pretty much it about this documentary. If you wish to see it for yourself, I'll link all the parts in the description down below. This was a topic that had been suggested to me a while ago, and after doing a little bit of research on it, I knew I had to talk about it at some point on the channel. War Eagles is an unmade movie from the late 1930s that had such a crazy concept to it, it makes me wish that it actually got made. The movie would revolve around a test pilot who would crash onto an island inhabited by dinosaurs, giant eagles, and a tribe of Norsemen. Nazi forces would also be on the island, using it as a sort of base of operations to plan for their mission to destroy New York City with newly developed weaponry. The pilot joins forces with the Norseman tribe to stop the Nazis and when the Nazis eventually leave the island and head towards New York, the pilots and the tribe pursue them using the giant eagles that the tribe managed to tame. In what I would only assume to be the third act of the movie, the Norseman tribe, the pilot, and their eagles would ensue in an intense sky battle with the Nazis over New York City. And if that doesn't sound like the most amazing adventure story of the century, then I don't know what to tell you. And to make things even better, the movie would have been directed by Marion C. Cooper and would have had its special effects and stop motion portions done by what some would call the father of stop motion animation himself, Willis O'Brien. Both of these people did work for the previous 1933 King Kong movie, which is all that needs to be said about their credibility for their craft. With people like this behind a project as ambitious as War Eagles, I wouldn't have been surprised if it ended up being an absolute hit. Now, yeah, when you break the film down to its most basic components, it bears a lot of similarities with the 1933 King Kong film. King Kong is about people who travel to an uncharted island and discover a tribe of people in a prehistoric ecosystem with a larger than usual modern animal used as its main creature protagonist if that's what you want to call Kong I guess, who is then taken to New York where the final act plays out. War Eagles is about a man who crashed onto an uncharted island and discovered a tribe of people living in a prehistoric ecosystem with larger than usual modern animals used as its main creature protagonist where they are also taken into New York where the final act plays out. Hell, it seems that War Eagles would have also featured a scene of a giant eagle fighting off a T-Rex. Now again, this is just what it seems like when broken down, however, based on what I've looked into, it seems that War Eagles still would have had enough of its own story to still offer somewhat of a different experience than King Kong. And with that into consideration, it wouldn't be a surprise that the film did well all on its own. But we'll never know because the film had been halted around 1939 and it would never be fully made. The film was in production as there were set pieces and concepts that had already been done for it, but production was ultimately stopped due to World War II. According to some sources, it was partly because the film studio knew making this movie around this time period would have been pretty risky, especially since Hollywood was relying heavily on the European market for profit on their films. So it was most likely a case of Hollywood not wanting to offend their overseas source of revenue. But the film was also stopped because Cooper actually re-enlisted into the military, leaving no one really in charge of the film. However, this story would become made through a different outlet. Instead of a movie, the story would be made into a book written by Carl Maystek in 2008. I would cover the book myself, but in doing research for this topic, I ran into a video made by Omni Viewer, who does an amazing job covering the book in greater detail. Seriously, this dude's commentary is on another level. I definitely recommend this video if you want to know more about the book, and check out the rest of his channel too, it has some pretty good stuff on there. 
It's a shame that we never got to see this movie. It really does sound like it would have been a great adventure movie, but by the time the war had settled and Cooper returned to the movie scene, War Eagles wasn't considered relevant anymore. So it wasn't revisited until its 2008 novelization, of course. Despite the fact this film was never made, it's cool to see that there are still some instances of it that exist today. A while ago, someone had suggested this very funny topic to me, however, I completely forgot who it was. So if you were the person that recommended that I look into this topic, let me know in the comments down below so I could give you proper credits. But this is a pretty funny little story about the Megalosaurus Bucklandi, the first non-avian dinosaur to be given a valid name. However, before it was given this official and much more professional name, one of its fossil remains was given a rather funnier name, which would be Scrotum Humanum. You heard that right. And if you're wondering why this specific fossil was given this name, I mean, just look at it. Do I really need to go in any more detail? Whatever, I'll do it anyways. So this all started back when the first remain of a dinosaur would be discovered in the modern world. It is widely believed that this dinosaur was Megalosaurus, but it's not 100% confirmed. We'll get to that in a bit, but one of its fossils was discovered by English naturalist Robert Plot in 1677. Keep in mind, this was before the term dinosaur was even created, so when the fossil piece was first discovered, Plot had no idea that he stumbled upon what was possibly a piece of a giant bipedal theropod. Initially, Plot guessed that it may have belonged to a Roman war elephant, but would later change this by saying the fragment may have belonged to a giant human as there are stories of giants within the Bible. Regardless of his guesses as to who this fossil piece belonged to, he did manage to identify it as a femur. Plot would provide his own illustrations of the femur in a book that he wrote called The Natural History of Oxfordshire, or at least people suspect that to be the femur of the Megalosaurus. And the reason why I say that is because apparently that specific bone would become lost. And while most people are sure that it belonged to a dinosaur based on what's been recorded about it, it's impossible to confirm if it actually belonged to a Megalosaurus. However, a lot of people are almost sure that it is based on the recorded illustration that Plot made for it. That illustration would later be reused in 1763 in another book called A System of Natural History, which was written by Richard Brooks. And Brooks would label this image of Plot's dinosaur bone as scrotum humanum. Brooks would actually use the common taxonomical concept known as the Linnaean system. The system allows the classification and naming of organisms and has been a huge part of natural sciences ever since it was created. In other terms, Brooks had used the binomial nomenclature for this fossil illustration, which binomial nomenclature is a system that's used to devise a two-part name for an organism, both of which are always Latin. And this is basically just another part of the Linnaean system. Now I know what you're thinking. Diego, that wasn't an organism that was being labeled, but simply an illustration of a fossil fragment. So obviously he wouldn't be able to use this system for that? Well, my best guess is that maybe today he wouldn't be able to do that, but apparently at one point you were able to apply the same system to classify geological materials as well. Or who knows, maybe you're still able to do that. I wasn't able to find much on it, but I wouldn't really be surprised if maybe it was used in certain scenarios. But again, I've never heard of something like that happening before, and this is just what it sounds like from the sources I'm using. Of course, if I'm wrong about anything here, do let me know in the comments down below. Anyways, obviously Brooks would then name the fossil drawing Scrotum Human and this was most likely used as a way to poke fun at Plot's drawing. And here's where things get funnier. Because the name Scrotum Humanum had been actually published, it technically had priority over Megalosaurus, even if it wasn't intended as an official name for the dinosaur. This would result in debates and controversies around the situation, but in the end it would be recognized as a name that simply was not intended to be for the sake of taxonomy, at least according to the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature. There are some factors of this story that are still up in the air, like whether or not the femur actually belonged to the Megalosaurus, and it will most likely stay that way as this is just one of those events that wasn't properly documented, at least in the beginning when Plot was making the initial discovery and illustrations. Regardless, it's still a pretty funny story. 